All right, specialized network devices. So specialized network devices are devices that we put in our network that serve a specialized function. Ha ha, right? Uh, but yeah, they, there's more than just our routers and our switches and our servers and our clients uh, in our networks. We have specialized devices as well. These devices are used either to give us more usability, better performance, or more security. Different types of devices we're going to talk about are things like VPN concentrators, firewalls, DNS servers, DHCP servers, proxy servers, and content engines and switches. So VPN concentrators. Uh, essentially what a VPN concentrator does is it allows you to connect multiple locations at multiple different sites with, with secure communications over an untrusted network. So as you can see in the top picture here, you might have somebody who's at home on their personal computer and they want to be able to connect to their work network. They can create a VPN tunnel, go over the untrusted internet and dial back in to their trusted internet, uh, their, their intranet at work. Also, we can do, uh, and that creates us a secure virtual tunnel over an untrusted network such as the internet. Another device that we have is what's called a VPN concentrator. So while my client is going to dial into that uh, intranet back at work, I need to have something there to answer that phone call. And when I say phone call, I'm really talking about an IP address connection, not a physical phone call, even though in the old days we did do dial-up VPNs. Uh, and this VPN tunnel is terminated on the other end by what's called a VPN concentrator. Firewalls can perform this function. Some routers can perform this function. But generally, if you're using a headquarters that's going to be doing a lot of VPNs, they will use a VPN concentrator to do that. And essentially, it's a big machine that's going to answer all of those, those uh, inbound VPN requests. Another way you can use your VPN concentrators is to do site-to-site -site communications. So for instance, let's say I have a company in DC and I have a company in Los Angeles. One of the ways I can connect those two is I can buy a leased line, which would be like a fiber optic cable, connecting Los Angeles to DC. That would be pretty darn expensive, though. The other way I can do it is each site can get connected to the internet. I can put a VPN concentrator on each side and they will make a virtual tunnel over their internet connection so that now they are connected to each other without anybody being able to see their traffic because this tunnel has secure encryption uh, protecting it. We're going to cover VPNs specifically in a separate module and how VPNs work with IPsec uh, and the way we do tunneling uh, but just for right now we're just talking about the fact that a VPN is a way to have a secure network tunnel between two places over an unsecure network such as the internet. Firewalls. Firewalls are a primary network security appliance. They stand guard for you at the end, edge of your network and they protect it from malicious internet traffic. So your firewalls, they can either be software based or hardware based. If you're running a small, medium, or large size business, you're probably going to have a hardware based firewall. Most personal computers have a software firewall installed on them as well. Uh, firewalls can be either stateful or stateless. A stateful firewall allows traffic that originates from inside the network to go out to the internet, but will block traffic from outside from getting in. And what that means is if you are sitting at your desk and you go to Facebook.com, your firewall keeps track of the fact that you went to Facebook. And so when the reply comes in from Facebook, it's going to let that in. Whereas if Facebook initiated it to you, your network might block it based on firewall policy. And so if you make the request, the firewall is going to keep track of that and let things in. This is very good from a usability standpoint because when you make a request, you're using some random high number port and then traffic's going to come back in on that random high number port. And so normally those ports are going to be shut down from a firewall perspective. And so it keeps track of these in ingresses and egresses based on your request and then giving you the reply you asked for. Uh, you can see a picture of that here on the left where if I made the request, the reply was allowed, but if the initial request came from the outside, it was blocked. And so this is good from a security standpoint. Um, the thing you have to remember about this, though, if you're using a stateful firewall, is if your employees and your users initiated the request, the firewall is going to let it go. Okay? This is why spear phishing is so popular in the security realm, or the, the malware realm, uh, because if somebody sends you a link in an email and you clicked on that link, you just requested that information to go out and come back to you. You opened a hole in the firewall to come back. And that's why spear phishing works so well. And it's really, really difficult to prevent. You really got to train your users to prevent that type of thing because firewalls alone cannot pretend, prevent, prevent you from doing that. DNS servers. So DNS servers are domain name servers. And they have the job of translating names to numbers and numbers to names. So if you go to something like jasondion.com, 
that's a whole lot easier to remember than going to 66.123.45.237, right? And so if you go to jasondion.com, the computer doesn't really understand that, but the DNS server understands to switch that to an IP address and then route the traffic there. Um, this is similar to a contact list on your phone. A lot of times nowadays, we all have our digital smartphones, and we go into our contact list, and I would click on, for instance, my kid. I don't know her phone number, but I know if I click on her face in my, in my contact list, she'll pick up the phone, right? It's kind of like a DNS server for me. It's names to numbers, numbers to names. I don't have to memorize the numbers. I just need to remember the name. Um, same thing, and that's what DNS allows us to do because it's a whole lot easier to remember Google.com than it is 66.123.45.237. Uh, computers like the numbers better. We as people, we recall names better, and DNS does that for us. Um, as you can see here in the image, when you make a request to go to Google.com, what really happens is your PC goes to the DNS server and says, what is Google.com? The DNS server says, it's this IP address, and then your computer goes out to the internet to that IP address. DNS servers, we have two things that we talk about with those. One is called the FQDN and one is called the URL or URL. Okay? FQDN is a fully qualified domain name. This would be something that has your domain name that you've purchased from a top level domain provider as well as a, either representing web or mail or FTP. For instance, uh, if you go to my website, it's www.jasondion.com. If you want to go to my mail server, it's mail.jasondion.com. If you want to go to my file server, it's ftp.jasondion.com, right? It's a .com, which meant I had to go buy that from the .com top-level domain provider, and I pay them their $15 a year so I can have that domain name. Now, when you talk about a URL or a uniform resource locator, we take that fully qualified domain name and we append to the front of it, or prepend, the way we're going to access that data. So, for instance, you can go to http colon slash slash www.jasondion.com and get to my non-secure public-facing website. If you go to https, that means you want to access it securely. That way you can like process your credit card payment on there. You would put that in there instead, https colon slash slash www.jasondion.com. If you want to get to my file server, you would use ftp colon slash slash whatever it is, right? Uh, if you're going to use an Apple file server, it's like AFP colon slash slash. So that front part tells you how you're going to access it. In the old days, you had to actually put that into your web browser. For about the last 20 years, though, all browsers by default understand that if you just put in jasondion.com or www.jasondion.com, what you really mean is HTTP colon slash slash www.jasondion.com. And so it adds that for you even though you didn't ask them to. Okay. Uh, where it really becomes important is if you want to make sure you go to a secure site, you need to make sure you have the S in there, HTTPS, to get to the secure site. Uh, there's lots of different top-level domains. I have three of them shown here on the board. We have .com, .mil, .edu. There's a lot of other ones out there now. There's .org, there's .net, um, there's .xxx, .us, you know, all the different country codes. There's a lot of them out there. And so if you want to buy a website domain, you would go to that particular provider and pay the money to get it. DHCP, which is our Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol. Uh, the way I always remember this one is Dora the Explorer, okay? Because Dora is Discover, Offer, Request, and Acknowledge. It's how DHCP works. What DHCP allows us to do is it allows us to dynamically configure our hosts with their IP address information. In the old days, we had to actually go to every client and manually configure it, which is what we call statically assigning it, to communicate. So I'd have to go to your computer and give it its IP address, its subnet mask, its gateway, and its DNS server. This led to a lot of configuration errors because technicians would mistype numbers. Uh, and it also is a really big hassle for large networks. Imagine if you had a network of 5,000 machines you had to do this for. I lived that dream back in 2009. We had 5,000 machines that were statically configured. It was a nightmare. Every time you went to do some change and the technician brought a new computer out, he had to make sure that IP address wasn't used in one of the 5,000 previous ones. Otherwise, you have conflicts. DHCP is a lot easier. You give the DHCP server what's called a scope, which might be, let's say I'm going to give it 50 IPs to use. They're going to use 192.168.1.2 through 1.51. And if I tell it to use those, it'll start handing them out. First person who requests one gets the first one. Second person gets dot three. Third person gets dot four. And we just keep handing them out. And it keeps track of all that for you. So it automates the whole process for you, and it is supported by most network devices out there. Uh, key elements assigned through your DHCP are your IP address, your subnet mask, your default gateway, and your DNS server addresses. Those are the four things that computers need to be able to get online. 
And the way this works is when a PC wants to get an IP, it comes on and it does a discover request. The DHCP server then gives it an offer back. Step three is your PC then says, I request the offer that you gave me. So I agree that I want that IP. And the fourth one is the DHCP server acknowledges that that PC now has that IP address and it is now his. The DHCP then gives it what's called a lease. And that lease can be configured by the administrator. Typically it's three days, seven days, or 30 days. And so what happens is if you have a three day lease, after three days is up, the computer, the DHCP server will go back to the computer and say, hey, do you still need that IP address I gave you? And if it says yes, it keeps it for another three days, it renews it. If it says no, it just takes it back. Or if it can't get a hold of it, it just takes it back. Which is fine, because then when the PC comes online again, it will request a new one and get a new IP. Because it doesn't need the same IP all the time as a client, it just needs an IP to use. Proxy servers. So a proxy server is a device that makes the request to the external network on behalf of the client. It acts as its proxy. So as you can see here in the diagram, I have three PCs that want to go to the internet. They'll go from them to the proxy server, and then the proxy server will go out to the internet. The reason we do this is a couple of reasons. Uh, one, in the old days, the proxy server actually could give us a copy of the information that was being seeked. It had a cache copy on the server. So it sped up your connection because you didn't have to go out to the internet to get the news from CNN.com. You could just get the local copy that was already gotten by the other person. Because if Michelle goes to the site right now and John goes there 30 seconds later, it's probably the same website. And so the proxy server could give that to you. Uh, if it wasn't in the cache and John went there, then John would then go out and it would go all the way to the internet, get the information and bring it back, and the server would keep a copy in cache for the next person. While this worked really good in the old days, with Web 2.0 and all the social media that we have nowadays, it doesn't work nearly as well. Think about when you go to news.google.com, okay? Does John's website for news.google.com look anything like Michelle's? Probably not. Or a better example, Facebook. We all go to facebook.com, right? Every single one of us has a different profile page and different friends on there. So our news feeds look completely differently. So Proxy does absolutely nothing for us there from a caching perspective. Now one of the things Proxy does do is we can actually do content filtering from there and we can do logging from there to give us more security. So the Proxy server, we can have a bunch of keywords that say you can't go to these sites that contain these words or you can't go to these particular websites. For instance, if you're at your house and you have a bunch of little kids in there, you may not want them going to pornographic websites. So anything with XXX in the title should probably be banned, or porn, or naked, or any of that kind of stuff, right? Um, the other thing your proxy server can do is it does logging functions. So in a workplace environment, if John has been surfing gambling websites at work, I can see that in the logs. And then we can hold him accountable with administrative actions and say, John, you're now fired, right? Um, or whatever it happens to be, whatever the policy of the company is, uh, depending on what agreements you have signed. But that's one of the functions that our proxy server can do, is it can tell us all the sites you've gone to. And the logs are pretty detailed. Um, at the company I work for, we don't allow pornography at work, which seems like something you shouldn't have to tell people, but apparently it is. Um, you'd be amazed at the amount of pornography we find at work uh, in our logs. And we do random searches through our logs to find people who are using it, and they get in trouble for it. And we have people all the time say, it wasn't me. Well, when you go in the proxy logs and you pull up user John Smith, and you see that he went to a porn site, and not only was he at the porn site, but he spent 35 minutes there, he clicked through 17 different links, went three levels deep, and then he tells you, oh no, I must have just clicked it by accident. Not if you were there for that long and did that many clicks, right? Um, and so we can see that stuff with the proxy server. It gives us a lot of that ability from a security perspective, so it's good. Um, the other thing that a proxy server does is it prevents other people from mapping out your network well. And what I mean by that is attackers will sometimes come in and start scanning your network to find out how many clients you have and enumerate what your network looks like from the outside. A proxy server can help prevent that because they're going to see the proxy server. They're not going to see everything behind the proxy server. So in this network, you would see one machine, not three machines, right? And that's another benefit. So how does our proxy server function? Well, my PC makes a request to the proxy server and says, hey, I want to go to google.com. That server then forwards that request out to the internet if there's not a local copy, gets the information, and then passes it back to the PC that was requested. It makes a log of it, so it knows what time you did it, how long you were there, how many levels deep you went. Um, and again, if it has a local copy, it'll give you that as well, which will save you some bandwidth on your WAN link. Caching engines. So, some people are what we call a geographically dispersed user or a limited bandwidth user, okay? And if you have a site like that, you may want to use a content engine to overcome it. 
So what a content engine or a caching engine does is it is a dedicated appliance that performs caching functions just like a proxy server would, but it does it a better job of it and does it much, much larger. Okay? So for instance, in our example here, I have the headquarters and I have a branch office. Let's say I have a branch office in the middle of rural North Carolina where the fastest internet connection they have is maybe a one megabit per second connection for the whole office, right? That is not a very fast connection. And a lot of things we do nowadays, like if we're teaching, uh, we might have a lot of video content that the students need to see. With that one megabit per second connection, they're not gonna be able to get that content downloaded fast enough for all the students. So what we can do is we can put a content engine there and the data will sync from our server to the content engine. And now when the user's in that branch office, are trying to see that content, they'll go locally to the content engine inside their building and never use the WAN link to get to it. So it saves us a whole lot of bandwidth. Uh, and what ends up happening is usually in off times, like in overnights when everyone's sleeping, all the new data will be pushed to that content engine so it will constantly get new data. Uh, for instance, I, I work with the US Navy and on their ships they have content engines which has tons of video and, uh, and lessons that they have, electronic learning lessons, on a local server that is pushed to overnight while everybody's sleeping. And that way, because they're relying on a satellite link, which is a very small bandwidth pipe, their users don't have to go out to YouTube to go watch the video. They can just do it locally on that machine. So that's, that's a real big benefit of content engines. It, it takes away the need to use your WAN link as much and uses a lot of the stuff locally. All your requests and reply go straight inside the building, as you can see here, from the PC to the content engine and back. Content switches, uh, they are known as load balancers, uh, and what they do is they're gonna distribute your incoming requests across a variety of servers in the server farm. This is where you gotta think about these big companies like Google and Amazon and Microsoft. They have very high demands on their servers and lots and lots of users trying to access them at once. A single piece of hardware is not gonna be able to accomplish all that, so that's where we use a content switch. So what happens is as somebody comes into Google, it will then say, okay, this user goes to server one, this user goes to server two, this user goes to server three, and it keeps handing out those requests to make sure no single server gets overwhelmed by all the requests. And that is our specialized network devices.